everyone. I would like to welcome you all to the final night of Senior Project Presentations. My name is Rafe Williams, and I will be your MC for tonight. And first, I would like to remind you all to silence your cell phones for the night and help me in welcoming Mr. Boyce. Okay, um, usually I get up here and I make a little announcement about your program and some things like that, but I'm scrapping that tonight. Um, I just wanna say this, Senior Project is supposed to be about learning about a little bit about flexibility and resilience and adjusting your goals. And these seniors got a master class in that this year. And I just wanna take a second to rep, uh, recognize the whole class and the job you've done this year, well done. And that's all you're gonna hear from me, so I wanna turn it back over to Rafe, thanks. Our first speaker of the night comes to us from the woods and will like to tell us a story of how he crafted a home for our feathered friends. Please welcome Damien. Everything working? All right. Coming into this year, I had no idea what to expect from senior projects. But then I learned of the idea that instead of me being taught by a teacher, I could create something myself. This was such a cool idea to me. I was so overwhelmed with ideas. Should I do something involving a charity, building project, or helping the environment? With so many different ideas, I decided why not just do them all? I remember when I was growing up, I lived right by a bird sanctuary called Hawk Mountain. This was a really beautiful area located right on top of the mountain ridge. As a kid, I used to hike on the various trails, exploring nature and watching different types of birds fly through the trees. This is when I started to develop a passion for helping the environment. With this experience and passion for helping, the na for helping nature, I thought of why not do something that would help the bird species? This is when I came up with the idea to build a naturally blending birdhouse that I would donate to a local lake. With the further use of new pesticides and increasing habitat loss, the bluebird was the type of bird species I needed to help. Since we were virtual for the winter term of the school year, I found out the dorms were reopening. I immediately thought to myself, this was going to completely turn my project upside down. I had originally planned my project to all be done at home, so I already knew who was going to be my mentor, and I had a workplace and wood. Luckily, Mr. Boyce recommended I reach out to a local in Bernathan who is a carpenter and bird enthusiast. His name, Rich Shao. He immediately agreed to help me and provide a workplace as well as guidance for building my project. With a new plan, and workplace, I moved on to the next obstacle, where I was going to find wood aged long enough and have a low moisture content. This was a key factor in the building process because if the wood is too wet, it will often crack and break, which could ruin the wood. Luckily, Mr. Shao had a couple of spots up his sleeve and we were able to secure some red cedar. Fortunately, the, w the wood had been aging in the wild for over four years. This was perfect because drying out wood can take years to process. Once we had acquired the red cedar, I drew up plans for what I wanted the birdhouse to look like. We then drove around the town, checking out different designs and seeing what different aspects we liked from the unique birdhouses. As we studied different houses, I started to integrate them into my own design. Once I drew up a sketch that I liked, we began the process of cutting the wood. This finally allowed me to get my hands dirty and oh man did I.
Mr. Shao recommended the idea that I cut the edge pieces of the wood with a chainsaw, creating a natural carving edge. This was a difficult process because I had to cut the wood on its side, making it so that I had to use the chainsaw on an angle and without cutting too much off, otherwise we wouldn't have enough wood. Luckily, I had experience in the past with chainsaws, so I was able to keep a steady cut and not mess up. After cutting the main pieces, we started measuring out the different spots we'd have to cut. The difficulty with this task was the fact that we had left the wood with as much of a natural edge as possible. This made it hard, this made it hard for us to draw and shape the pieces to the proper lengths we wanted. We then spent most of our time constantly measuring and orienting the appearance of the pieces. After much precision cutting and cups of coffee, we had the pieces, the sizes, and lengths we wanted. The next step was screwing the parts together. Since there were natural edges, we needed to figure out the strongest areas of the pieces and then make sure it fit properly. After trying many diverse areas, we found the optimal spots and drew up our drilling holes. We first started off by drilling the back plate with the side pieces. This proved to be much more of a challenge than we had anticipated because the natural edges were all distinct lengths and sizes, which made the pieces go together awkwardly. We then had to level the wood to the exact same proportions in order for them to fit nicely together. Once we got the two side parts and back pieces screwed in properly, we decided to drill the front piece into the two sides before drilling the hole in the center of the house. The reason for this choice to drill the front piece in before drilling the center hole was because the way the entire front piece was made, it made it more stable while we were drilling. This worked out great, and we luckily had no issues drilling the hole. Now, the final piece to the house was the roof. This was going to be the hardest part, because I wanted the entire sl piece slanted and hanging partly off the front giving it better coverage and less chance for debris to accumulate. This meant I had to cut the top piece to the exact shape in order for it to fit nicely on the top. After hours of precision cutting, we attached the top pieces to the birdhouse, finishing up the project. I was immediately filled with pride that I had created a natural, authentic bluebird house that I could put out in the world to help young bluebirds create new families. I have learned so much more than I expected from building this project. Being able to plan and create something I thought was really cool to me was extremely valuable and special. Being able to forge something from scratch and donate it to a local lake really gave a sense of pride and accomplishment. This has allowed me to not only better myself, but the environment in my hometown. I think senior projects is a really unique class that you can take a lot away from if you put a lot of effort into it. Creating and planning this entire project was, was divergent and unique to my other classes. It felt like I was doing something I was passionate about, instead of being given work and assignments like any other class. I am so grateful for being able to take part in this unique experience. I also want to thank the people that helped me make this happen. I hope my project has a positive initiative for bluebirds in my community and motivates others to help do the same. Thank you, and finally, here's my product. So are there any questions? Yes, sir. Um, so the question was how many hours I put into the entire project. And I actually didn't calculate the entire hours, but I spent probably every Sunday to Thursday three to four hours a day um, working on the project. It um, took a lot longer as well because we had to wait for the wood to age out and dry out. So we did have to wait a lot longer. So I, it did take me a lot longer to finish the project. Amal? Um, so the question was, uh, do I want to like pursue anything um, environmentally helping the environment? And 
I think definitely yes. Um, we're at a point where our country or our planet is really struggling with the environment, and I think I want to take my part in helping and doing that and saving it. All right. Any other questions? Uh, yes, so the whole thing, oh, sorry. The question was, is the whole thing actually made out of red cedar? And it is. The, the base and, yeah, the entire structure is made out of red cedar. Yeah. Um, no, so I actually used beeswax as, um, to like kind of seal up any holes, and it's a natural um, thing, so it had no effect on the birds. And I didn't want to use any finish because obviously the effect on the birds and the environment as well. All right. I would now like to give five minutes for our judges to collect their thoughts, and while they're doing that, you can quietly talk amongst yourselves.
Our second speaker tonight has fully embraced his inner geek by learning the language of the computers. Please welcome Daniel Keyes. When you think of computer coding, what do you think of? Maybe a string of ones and zeros, or that green text from the matrix. I can tell you it's not like that at all. Coding languages are more akin to English. Take Python, for example, the coding language I use for my project. People with little coding knowledge can decipher more complex code because it is done mostly through simple statements in English. You can use simple statements like print, which will, allow you, which will print whatever text you put in. You can use if-then statements, which will allow you to set up specific scenarios. You can say, if this happens, then this will happen. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to the beginning of Senior Project. When I joined Senior Project, I had no idea what I wanted to do. My first thought was to do something fishing slash nature related, but clearly something changed. Something I was interested in was coding. I had never really done anything coding related before, but hearing my brother talked about it, talk about it piqued my interest. As I looked more into coding, it seemed like something really fun I could do for my project. So I decided to learn Python and make something with it. Once I decided on learning Python, I knew I wanted to make something data visualization related because I would like to go into data science in the future. But in the beginning, I set my sights a little too high. I wanted to make a program that could make all types of graphs. Line graphs, bar charts, scatter plots, pie charts, you name it, I wanted my program to be able to make it. But after meeting with my mentor, Dr. Neil Simonetti, we both agreed that there are already programs that can do this, like Google Sheets and Excel. So we decided I should make something that they can't do, like animations. And thus, my project was born. From that point on, my project was to learn Python and then make a program that could produce animated bar chart races that would look something like this. So there are two main phases of my project, learning Python and coding the bar chart race. The first month of my time was just spent learning Python. I learned things like basic math sequences, file handling, lists, dictionaries, if-then statements, wall and for loops, and what would eventually become the bread and butter of my project, the graphics package I was using, matplotlib. When I was learning the Python basics, my process went like this. I would sit down on my computer and go to a website called W3Schools and go down their list of Python basics. I would try to do two or three of their tutorials at a time and make a small practice code so I understood it better. You can just copy and paste that same process for about a month because it wasn't until I was trying to code the program itself where things got difficult. When I started working on my program, I took everything on a week-by-week -week basis. First, I just wanted to try to put data from a text file into a static graph. That was easy enough. So then it was time to animate a graph with data from a text file. I had already animated a simple line graph and thought it would be just as easy. Let me tell you now, I was wrong, very wrong. This is where some true challenges came into my project. The first big challenge was animating the bar chart itself. Like I said, I'd already animated a simple line graph and thought the same principles would apply. I struggled with it for about a week. And when my mentor meeting came around, Dr. Neil Simon Eddy helped me immensely. We went over everything I tried to do in the past week. And then in under an hour, 
he was able to animate a bar graph with a graphics package he had never used before. It was amazing. He helped me so much. But that moment of relief did not last very long. The next thing I had to do was crucial to making the program work. And that was sorting the bars. In a bar chart race, the bars are sorted so the biggest one always stays on top. This concept was easy to understand, but incredibly hard to code. I went through many iterations of potential code that I thought would work. I tried using Python's built-in sort commands, but like many other things I tried, that did not work with what I was trying to do. After about two weeks of trying to figure this out, I went back to something I was avoiding called data frames. At the time, they seemed like a very complicated topic, and I thought I could solve my problem in an easier way. In the end, I couldn't, and data frames were the solution. Data frames allowed me to sort the bar chart by a variable of my choice. In this case, I set the variable to be home runs. This made it so I could always keep the biggest bar on top. Now, the core of my project was done. I had an animated bar chart with sorted data. But looking at a sea of moving blue bars wasn't the most interesting. So I decided it needed some color. And you would think this would be easy. <sighs> it wasn't. I needed the colors to stay with a specific bar. When I first tried to do it, the colors ended up being locked to a position, not the bar, and that just made everything more confusing. The colors took a while to figure out, too. And I basically had the solution from the get-go, but in this instance, I was the problem. I was accidentally inputting the chunk of code into the wrong part of the program. But maybe that's what I get for trying to make something so complex after knowing Python for all of two months. After I figured that out, I worked on little aesthetic changes, like adding axi titles and other things that tightened everything up a bit. I was so happy I could finally hit the Run button and no red text would appear at the bottom of my screen, give me some random error I had never heard of before. And then my project was done. So it was time to work on my service piece. My plan in the beginning was to give the final product to the ANC math department. But as my project changed, it became less and less useful to them. And I was focusing so much on the project itself that the service piece slipped my mind for a little while. In the end, I did what I could do. I posted my code on the premier code sharing website, GitHub. I posted the code and a tutorial on how it all works. I'm happy it is now out there because when I was working on my project, there were almost no examples of how to make animated bar chart races. I hope this small tutorial can help other people doing similar things as me. My project taught me many things. I learned that I have terrible time management skills for one. But in all seriousness, I learned a lot from the many ups and downs of my project. Whether it was the time I couldn't figure out how to animate the graph and my mentor swooped in and figured it, in, figured it out in under an hour, or when I finally figured out how to sort the colors with a specific bar after trying for way too long. These two experiences taught me lessons that I will use throughout my life. Number one, I learned to lean on others more. For so much of my project, I tried to learn everything from the internet when I had a mentor that taught computer science. I know now that I should have asked more questions and asked for help rather than just struggling until our scheduled meetings. Number two, I learned perseverance. There were so many times where I had all the tools I needed to solve whatever coding problem was in front of me, but I just couldn't figure it out. I learned I needed to just stick with it and push through whether it was giving it a day and coming back to it or pushing on for just 10 more minutes. I'm sure I'll use these two lessons for many years to come. OK, I've talked about my program for a long time now. So let me show you how it all works. So here it is. These two lines here read the text file and divide it into name, home runs, years, and positions. These three lines tie the colors to the positions so the colors stay with each bar. And then this big old chunk of code is what actually establishes the bar chart. This line here is what actually makes the bar chart. The rest is more stylization and sorting. 
And then the last line at the bottom here is what actually animates the graph. Now, let me show you what the final product looks like. This bar chart race shows career home runs of different baseball players. You can see their names on the left and the number in gray showing the year in their career. Looks better than a sea of moving blue bars, right? A ton of effort went into it, and I'm proud of the final product. All in all, I learned so much from my project and had a ton of fun working on it, even if sometimes I was banging my head against my desk. I learned many things, like the coding itself and the life lessons along the way. I'll be sure to use all of my newfound skills and lessons in the future. Thank you. Are there any questions? I'm all. So the question was, why did I choose baseball as my topic? Um, simple answer, I really like baseball. Uh, other than that, it was just a data set I found online, so I didn't have to make one myself. <laughs> Mr. Crelland? So the question was, why did I choose Python over other coding languages? So in the beginning, I actually wanted to learn JavaScript. But talking with my mentor, he told me that Python was actually more widely used for data visualization. So that's why I chose it. Yeah? So I can say that a little louder. Yeah. So the question was, how long did it actually take me to learn it versus like to make it? Um, I was really learning the entire way through. I never stopped. I learned the basic stuff in the beginning, but even while I was creating the program itself, I was still learning new things. So if I was to give you like my total project hours, it was probably between 70 and 80 hours for the full thing. Yes? I know I already asked the question. I'm going to ask another one. It's all good. Uh, so the question was, am I going to do more programming now, or am I done with it? Uh, I would very much like to do more programming. I plan on getting at least a computer science minor in college, and beyond that, get a master's in data science. So definitely more coding in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I would like to give the judges another five minutes to collect their thoughts, and you guys may talk amongst yourselves.
Our final speaker of the night gets more entertainment out of kids' shows than shows made for people her own age and goes into detail as to why with her podcast project. Please welcome Thea Keel. Hello and welcome to the Human Collectibles podcast. My name is Thea, I am the creator, writer, editor, and producer for this show. And today I'm going to be talking about what it was like for me to make this podcast. You have no idea how many times I've said that. <laughs> I made a podcast. I wrote, recorded, edited, and published five episodes, all talking about a different film. The goal was to combine my love of kids' shows and movies with my love of podcasts. I actually discovered that this is what I wanted to do by accident. Over the summer of 2020, three of my friends and I would hang out masked in my backyard in order to feel like we were still socializing in a pandemic. We had some interesting and incredibly thought-provoking conversations. At one point, one of us mentioned that it would be fun to create a sort of pandemic podcast of just us getting together and recording our discussions. I was hooked on the idea, and then it never ended up happening. However, on one of our later in the year visits, when the weather was still nice, I was talking about Senior Project and how I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do. One of them suggested, why not just make a podcast? And suddenly the idea started flowing. I discovered that I really liked the idea and felt like it was something I could accomplish. As the ideas came, I also realized that most of the topics I could think of had something to do with film. I had never thought about how much I love film and everything related to it. The way a certain scene is set up, the behind the scenes work, the art style, or even just the story the film is telling. That conversation and this project helped me realize how much I really want to be involved in a piece of film someday. I am eternally grateful to my friends for essentially figuring all of that out for me and helping me start something I ended up loving. So now I know what I want to do, but I need a mentor. I talked to a total of four people about podcasting. They all gave great advice, and even if they didn't become a mentor, talking to them helped me because it gave me a little bit of background or basic information about podcasting. The final meeting I had related to finding a mentor was with Ben Keyes. He was the person I talked to that knew everything I didn't know, specifically about producing and managing equipment and technology. He's actually a producer for two of the other people that I talked to, and that's how I ended up getting in touch with him. I had a meeting with him that was about 40 minutes long, and he agreed to be my mentor. The project of finding a mentor in itself helped me a lot with the rest of my project as a whole, and will probably stick with me in the future, because it taught me how to reach out and ask for help. It also taught me that no one really knows what they're doing. I've been told that my entire life, from people trying to be comforting, but unless you experience something that makes that statement true for you, it's going to be hard to believe. So that was not comforting to me until I actually needed help and reached out to people. So now I have a mentor to guide me through the whole process. The process was a lot of work, and it was complicated. For the making of just one episode, I would first have to pick which show or movie I wanted to review. Then I would make an outline in a Google Doc, spend about five to eight hours researching the show or movie to discuss, then record, edit, and finally publish. The amount of time each task took evolved a lot as I gained more knowledge and experience. For example, in the beginning, my very first episode took closer to 10 hours to edit completely. And by the last episode, editing an episode took me around two to three hours. I got better at navigating GarageBand, and besides the actual act of editing, the structure and format of my episodes got easier to understand, and therefore easier to edit. Sometimes it surprises me the amount of change that took place in just a few months. The difference between my first episode and my last episode is very large. My first episode, which is about the kids' cartoon called The Owl House, was recorded in my closet. I eventually set up a homemade sound booth that my mom made, and it took me afternoon until evening to record it. Then afterwards, I edited it for roughly 10 hours, which also included re-recording some things that I didn't like. The making of the first episode was messy and long, but I was excited. 
I thought I did a good job on my first try, and I was inspired to keep going. The second episode was actually rougher and messier than the first. I was really looking forward to this one, maybe even more than the first, because it was a show that I really loved. It's a cartoon called Over the Garden Wall, and it's a show that lets its audience interpret a lot of its show, which means a big part of the fandom is fan theories and theorizing in general about it. I really liked this aspect, but I didn't quite know how to say that, and so it just ended up being me talking about fan theories for around 40 minutes in a big jumbled mess with no structure. Editing it was rough, because only then did I realize that I didn't like the way I said anything. But of course, I have to have at least one horrible episode to make the other ones look slightly better. <laughs> On the bright side, editing it didn't take long. I still had a lot of room for improvement, but this time it only took around three hours. However, that was after a good week or two of procrastination, which was something I constantly struggled with. I kept putting it off for so long that I started and almost finished two other episode scripts <laughs> before I even started editing this one. So, after that train wreck, I was somewhat discouraged, but discovered that I still loved what I was doing, and that gave me the motivation to keep going. The third episode was great. I loved the movie of discussion, which was the Pixar movie called Soul. I liked the material it brought up related to the movie, and I liked the structure of the episode itself. This was the episode where I realized that my formatting really wasn't doing anything for me. I put everything in sections, and then I would explain, now I'm going to talk about this, which was not great by itself, but besides that, I put the sections in an order that just didn't flow. For example, I used to put the section about behind-the-scenes work and production after I had explained the whole premise in depth. So to figure out where I needed to put things is I would read the script out loud to myself as if I were recording. Every time I got to the end of a section in the script, I would take my eyes off the page, say the next logical thing that I had researched, and then look back at the page, and if things weren't in the right spot, I could move them around. This method really worked for me because it gave me a chance to, one, practice my podcasting skills, and two, it made me think about structure in a different way. Now feeling extra enthusiastic and invigorated, I was eager to work on the next episode. I ended up writing the last two scripts at the same time. I wrote one for the Netflix cartoon called Hilda, and the last one for the Pixar movie called Onward. I liked these ones a lot because as I got more comfortable with podcasting, I also got more comfortable talking about more personal things and deeper, more meaningful topics. One of the episodes brought up parenthood and the other brought up grief, both interesting and at times intense topics. Parenthood has been a prominent thing in my world recently, especially as I grow up and learn how to take the wheel of my own life, as well as watching my younger siblings slowly learn how to navigate the world. As for grief, that is a part of my world every day. The last episode actually went to a place that I was not expecting, and in many ways it was therapeutic, because I got to process emotions and feelings, which I haven't done much of at all. So, if you want to listen to me talk about personal grief for half an hour for whatever reason, that might be an adventure. <laughs> I had been trying for a while to figure out what kind of energy I wanted my podcast to have. Did I want it to feel more structured, like I had an itinerary in front of me that I didn't stray from? Or did I want it to feel looser and let myself go on more tangents? I ended up doing a little bit of both. The first part of an average episode was mostly structured with background information on the film, and then as I got more into the plot, themes, and production, I would let myself go on a separate tangent and bring myself back. That was the part that let me talk a bit about myself. My mentor, Ben Keyes, mentioned fairly early on that people are going to listen for the content, but they're also going to listen for you, the speaker. That was something that I hadn't really thought of before, so I tried to find a balance of here's some content and here's some personal stuff that came from the content. I thought a lot about who I wanted my target audience to be. At first, the idea was that it could be for people who have not seen the show and are looking for show recommendations, or it could be for people who have seen the show and are looking for reviews or someone else's thoughts on it. I ended up going a little bit more with the latter. I had been listening to other podcasts, and one of them talked more about the speaker's experiences, and people listened for that. I really liked the way that that was structured, and so I ended up doing more of that in my episodes. I would bring up something to do with the show, and then relate it back to a personal experience. 
This meant that I would often end up explaining a lot of spoilers that people who have seen the show might be interested in hearing more about with real life experiences. As for technique when speaking, I was basically just winging it. We actually had a whole class period dedicated to helping us figure out how to speak when giving our presentations. This was after I had recorded most of my episodes, but I still thought it was interesting and valuable. Mr. Boyce showed us a video of someone telling the audience how to speak with conviction and confidence and not speak everything like a question. He would switch back and forth between a confident tone and a more casual questioning tone. Watching it, I noticed that I didn't hear a difference between the two because that back and forth is exactly how I did my podcasts. After watching the video, I noticed how much I end my sentences in a question. However, I continued to use a more casual tone with my podcasts because that's the tone and mood that I wanted to uphold. But I still liked the video and it definitely helped me write the speech. Something specifically about the performing aspect of podcasting that I had trouble with was how self-conscious I am of my voice. I didn't want to sound like I was serving you ice cream at Dairy Queen, like, hi, what can I get for you? And so to counteract that, I tried to make my voice sound lower and louder, like, hello and welcome to the Human Collectibles podcast. And it would somehow balance out. My service piece took a lot of brainstorming and throwing away really cool ideas that just weren't realistic. I ended up making a video that explained what the class senior project is to help students who don't know much about it but are curious. Then this video went up on YouTube and will be linked in the school website for students to access whenever they want. I am really glad I could give back to the class that helped me so much and I hope this means more people will be aware of it so it can help them in the same way. Senior project has taught me a lot about the world. I felt like this class introduced me to it and in some ways it really did. In the first part of the year, we get to talk to a lot of different people, some like journalists and futurists and many others who are doing things in the world that make them happy. It motivated me to try and stop worrying about what everyone else thinks and instead just focus on what I want to do. This class gave me the resources and the opportunity to do just that. I am forever grateful to the many people who helped me, including my mentor, my teachers, and my friends and family. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah? Yeah, so the question was, am I planning to record any more for my podcast? Um, and I actually really want to keep recording stuff. I might, I was thinking about trying to make other, like different podcasts where it's more discussion-like and maybe bring on guests, but I do want to continue with this podcast, especially in the future, in the summer. Yeah? Sorry? Yeah, so the question was, is podcasting something I want to do in the future, I believe? Uh, and I think I definitely want to incorporate thi it in things in my life. I think I want it to be more like a hobby, but I'm hoping that it'll sort of like get me places, like I was talking about with film. I'm hoping that my reviews will sort of help me, like boost me in that platform. Yeah? Yeah, so the question was, is there a way to know how many people have listened to my podcast? And uh, the hosting center that I use, Libsyn.com, tells me, I believe, how many listens have, or how many downloads have happened with my episodes. And the last time I checked, I believe it said like 64, maybe? So, yeah, roughly. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, so the question was, for an average episode, how much time would it be, or what was the ratio for recording and then editing, you said? Okay, so yeah, so for recording, it actually didn't take me that long. I think the longest that it took me was two hours, uh, and then re editing it, the first episode was 10 hours, but then after a while it evened out and went more to three hours, so yeah.
Thank you, Thea. And thank you all for coming to the final night of Senior Project. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening.